Mexico, he saw some incredible photos online of mushrooms that they were finding in Mexico, and he shot a note to the mycologist who was working there and said that he'd like to come uh, forage with him. So he spent a couple of years doing that, and then that mycologist moved on, and Ellen became the mycologist down there that people now go and forage with. So the Mexican government is flying him down to be a representative at their fungus fair this year, and he was described to me as um, being the American who is the foremost expert in uh, taxonomy of Mexican mushrooms. So that's a pretty, pretty um, honorable distinction, and we're just really grateful to have you here today, and I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thank you. So I just got back from five months in Mexico. And Mexico has pretty much the coolest mushrooms in the world. Usually I hunt mushrooms around the Bay Area, California, and I'll go all, every day for a whole season and I'll find maybe one, maybe two really cool things. And in Mexico I find one or two cool things every day. And so they just have a really amazing um, mix of East Coast mushrooms and tropical mushrooms. And then there's a lot of mushrooms that are endemic to Mexico many undescribed species to discover and uh, so many cool colorful things and so I just got back from five months there and put together this PowerPoint which has about one-tenth of one percent of the photos that I took um, but if you want to see the rest of them or if you want to see a good good quality picture uh, this. Can I interrupt you for one yeah. second? So in your honor, um, Nicolette Matt, who's right here, who's a jewelry artist, she makes amazing jewelry out of turkey tail and usually... The real noche is Ustalago Medis, and oh. it's a corn smut that grows on the corn. Wow. And basically it takes the kernels and makes them grow really big and all uh, crazy and black. And it's really common in the markets down in Mexico, and they usually use it to make quesadillas. And the taste of it is a lot like corn, but sort of like cheese as well, so it goes really well with quesadillas. <laughs> so I t what I do with all of my photos is I upload them to mushroomobserver.org. And Mushroom Observer is a really cool website. If you guys haven't seen it, you can upload your photos there, and then everybody else gets to vote on which mushroom you have. So it makes it really safe if you have good photos to identify your mushrooms and get a second opinion on them. Uh, but the other cool thing is that all of the photos on there are released under the Creative Commons license. And so that means you can download all of my photos and you can use them for whatever you want. You can make posters, you can even sell them as long as you put my name on there somewhere. Um, photos are free and open for everybody to have. So you can just search for all these things, mushroomobserver.org. This is one of my favorite parts of Mexico. It's over here on the East Coast. Thank you. And this is what it looks like. And this is my friend Alonzo. And Alonzo is a really excellent mycologist, one of the best microscopists in the world, and he works with Gaston Guzman at the Institute of Ecology in Veracruz. And I got to go take him across Mexico for six weeks this, this year. And he is really cool. He doesn't speak any English, so I learned a lot of Spanish um, in that time. And this is what the forest in Veracruz looks like. Um, this is the beach forest. And the beach is a very rare tree in Mexico, but there's this volcano, and down in the cone of the volcano, it's all beach. It was protected from the elements there. And here's my friends. And this is a really amazing place. There's a lot of mycorrhizal mushrooms that grow at beach. And they have the same amenium muscaria in Mexico as we have here. And the turkey tail is much darker in color. Um, this one is said to be more medicinal than the regular lighter in color version. And Tricaptum biforme is super cool. Um, it's super common. You see that all over the place. And then here's some Hypholoma fasciculare. And this um, the Latin name comes from the root word fasciculate, which means growing in a big cluster. And then Entheloma murrayi always um, has this really cool spike on the top of the cap. Lactarius indigo is edible and it's really good. <coughs> so um, a lot of times we'll fry these up and um, if you add them to eggs, they turn green. So you can make green eggs. And it's <laughs> <laughs> Cortinarius violaceus. Um, it's always fun to find. Is that edible? 
Yeah, it turns out all the purple cortinarius ended up being edible. And um, this one I sent off to Emily Herrower for DNA analysis. So we'll see if it's the same as the, re uh, the real cortinarius violaceus, which is described in the Pacific Northwest. And this Endoloma species, species is just amazing with the color. And I found this in Veracruz and also Oaxaca. And this is another one that uh, we're getting sequences of. And this is probably the most delicious mushroom in Mexico. This is uh, Amanita rubescens. And then I put sensu at amer, which means in the sense of the American authors. So the real Amanita rubescens is only in Europe. Um, but this is really common. This is probably the same Amanita rubescens we have on the east coast of the United States. You probably have it here in Illinois. And this Amanita is a poisonous raw, but when you cook it up, it is just amazingly delicious. I never find more than one or two at a time. But you know, when I fry it up, uh, everyone's just like, oh my gosh, I want more of that. The flavor is kind of like a really delicate white fish. It has a lot of natural glutamates in it, which makes a uh, really amazing umami flavor. And then Sipdotrama aspirata is um, pretty common on uh, conifer wood. And then here's a rare one, Limacella. It is a genus that's slimy, but it's very closely related to Amanita. But these are sapotropic, so they're growing off of the leaf, leaf litter back there. And then here's a new species of Cystoderma that we discovered. And uh, this is way different than all the other Cystodermas because it has very close gills. And um, it's really big. And I forgot to mention, but if anyone has any questions, you can just shout them out. Uh, it's probably best to take questions right when you think about them. Uh, but I'll also take questions at the end. This is a really cool Lepiota. Lepiota hemisclera. It always has this really cool pattern. Um, on top of the cap there. And this is Roretomyces roridus. It's really close to Mycena, but it's bioluminescent, and it has this amazing coat of slime over the site. And Splamulaster, it's always fun to find, it's really spiky. And this is Somosibi cerulipes. And this is a species that was described from the East Coast of the United States. And I just found it for the first time on December 1st of 2013. And this only grows with the beach, uh, beach wood, beach trees. So it's very rare in Mexico, but if you go to the beach forest and search for it, it's actually pretty common. So I found it for the first time on December 1st, and I went to another beach forest on December 2nd, and found it that day too. So it to be Neo Halopensis is one that was described from Jalapa, a little tiny psilocybe. Um, unlike most psilocybe that grow in the cities, this one grows way out in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't really need disturbed land. But for some reason, it's always grown out of a hole. So if you see down here, there's a hole in the ground. If you pull the stem, these can go up to 18 inches um, fruit from way down underground. And here's what the gills look like. And then Psilocybe cubensis is the only mushroom you can buy at a Grateful Dead show. <laughs> and it's, um, it's pretty common in Mexico, and we see it all over the place. And it's one of the few Psilocybes that has an annulus here. Um, the annulus is usually covered in purple brown spores. And then here's Psilocybe zapatocorum. This is one of my favorite mushrooms to photograph. It's really big and stains blue really strongly. So this cap over on the left, I just pinched the cap, and about a minute later took this photo. Beautiful cobalt color. And here's Alonzo, making photographs of it. And Alonzo is one of the world experts on psilocybe. Um, in fact, uh, two years ago, there was 12 species in the psilocybe zapatocorum group. And he did microscopic work in all the type collections and released a paper that synonymized these 12 species now into one species. So it used to be that when we found these, we had to do hours and hours of microscope work to figure out which one it was. And it was really difficult to do because they all seemed to be the same. And in fact, they all were the same. <laughs> <laughs> so pineal papillaceous, um, pretty common on manure. 
and these jet black spores. And they have these beautiful yellow rusulas. This is probably a new species of rusula, but it matches the description pretty well of rusula flavida. So we're going to check the DNA, see if it's really a new species, and if so, we'll give it a name. <laughs> so this is one of the best edible rusulas. Uh, nice mild flavor. And then Asterophora lycoprodoides is a mushroom that's parasitic on rusula. And it's unusual in that the spores form on the very top of the cap. And it does have gills, but the gills don't really do anything. And then we have this Cantharellus naturalinus marlicinus. Um, this is a really cool purple chanterelle that we find um, under the oak there. And this was described from Costa Rica by Rory Holling. And he saw these photos and he said, oh yeah, that's definitely the species. Do people sell them in the market there? Uh, in Mexico, they sell a lot of different mushrooms mm -hmm. in the market. I've never seen Cantharellus atrolites by the Venus in the market. It's super rare. I've only found it in one forest in all of the places I've gone. But um, there's other species of chanterelles that they sell in the market there. And they eat all sorts of mushrooms there that we wouldn't eat here. For example, Gonthus guacosis or Gymnopus doriophilus, all sorts of romarias. But really pretty cool site, um, you know, where it meets the gills here. And then Lactarius indigo is super blue. And um, what I like to do with Lactarius is take a pine needle and stick uh, the stem with the pine needle all over to let out some of the latex and that black box that you see here. And here's a new species of Xylaria. And it's kind of like the Xylaria that we have around here, except that it expands into all these different fingers coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, Cortinarius acutus, pretty <coughs> neat species of Cortinarius, has this really acute umbo on the top. <laughs> Definitely looks like one of those Mexican sombreros. <laughs> <laughs> so after Veracruz, then I headed to the state of Mexico, right in the middle. In the state of Mexico, is a really great place for hunting mushrooms. That's where Mexico City is, <coughs> capital of Mexico, and it's surrounded by volcanoes. And all of the volcanoes do a really great job of catching the rain. They're all national parks. <coughs> so they are covered in mushrooms. And this hummingbird kept visiting my campsite, and so I set up my camera with a, just a remote control and ate breakfast. And as soon as the hummingbird came back, I started taking pictures of it and got about 60 pictures in five seconds. <laughs> Here's a new species of bully. This one was a really high elevation up in Nevada de Toluca. Appears as though nobody's ever studied the bullies of Nevada de Toluca, because most of the bullies I find that are undescribed. The Pyphorellus porphyrosporus is a bully that has really dark colored pores. And then Felodon niger is really, uh, really common up there. And this one has teeth on the underside, lots of little spines hanging down, and the spores grow on the teeth. <coughs> and then Lycoperdon pyroforme is a good edible puffball. These, uh, this is the puffball that grows on wood. And this is Solosity molecula. So this is in a group of mushrooms called the Darumbes. And they're all hallucinogenic. This one comes out every year just along the side, right, right along the side of the road here. So because I show pictures of this road, we have tons of Mexican hippies looking for this spot. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever found it. <laughs> and then this is Hygrophorus hypophagus. But I put the F in there because it's not the real Hygrophorus hypophagus described from Europe. So the F means affinity. And so whenever you have an undescribed species or a whole bunch of species that are microscopically different, but they look the same, you can just put that F in there and it's kind of a weasel word you can use so you won't be wrong. <laughs> and this Amanita flavoconia is pretty common under pine. And the, the books say it's poisonous, but they actually sell it in all the markets in Mexico. And like all species in Amanita section validate, it is edible. <laughs> and, uh, here's a little picture that I took and I added it to Facebook. 
And the next day, I checked my Facebook wall and saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and this Mycena from Section Sanchezbury is always really cool to find. This, this whole thing is about an inch tall. Um, but the stem is covered in setae. Well, actually, not the stem. Plants have stems, mushrooms have mm -hmm. stipes. So the stipe is covered in setae, and then it's got this powdery covering all over the cap. So, really cool to find. It might be Mycena alitifora, but I need to scope this. And so when I find the mushrooms, I dry them and collect them. And this year I brought back 300 bags of dried mushrooms. And uh, a lot of people are surprised to hear that you're actually allowed to bring back mushrooms from foreign countries. Hmm. There's a list on the customs website of what you, you're allowed to bring back and what you're not allowed to bring back. And on the list of not being allowed to bring back is dirt. And the list that you can bring back is mushrooms. So what you have to do is break the stems, the base of the stem off your collections. And then it'll pass customs. And I always print out that list from the customs website. So if they try to give me trouble, I'll say, oh, here's your rule. <laughs> Coprinellus micaceus is super common, probably in every country in the world. And then this Flocularia luteovirens is super bright, so really easy to spot from a long ways away. And uh, this one's edible, sell it in markets. Always, always pretty cool to find. Always under pine. And here's an undescribed species. This is one that Rod Palas collected in the 70s, and he calls it species M36. <laughs> So when he knows about a species, but he doesn't have a name for it yet, he just assigns a numeral name. And this is from Section Cesarier. So Section Cesarier has this vulva here which flares way out like that. And then it has the really big, thick patch of universal veil remnants on the top of the cap. And there's a lot of deadly amanitas, and we'll see some in a few minutes. It looks super similar to this in that they're white. But in the deadly amanitas, the vulva doesn't flare out like this. Um, and there's a few microscopic differences, too, that are good to check before you uh, fry something like this up. Mm -hmm. So lots of the Aztec corn was named after the Aztec Indians. And this only grows in super high elevation. And it's only known from the volcanoes that surround Mexico City. This is the lowest find I've ever found it. This one was 2,953 meters. Usually I find it around 3,400 meters. And sometimes um, in, the, in the late season, this is one of the most common mushrooms up there. You can hardly walk without stepping on them. There's just thousands and thousands of them. For some reason, the hippies never find, found out about these. So never seen anyone out there picking them. The natives don't know anything about them. And they have a few morels in Mexico. Mm -hmm. This is Morpella rupa brunea. And um, this is one that I was always find, found at really high elevations, and it likes disturbed habitat. So this is one of those Abies fir forests, and um, likes to grow in ravines and areas like that. And I sent this one in for DNA sequencing, and they sequenced four loci and found that it was 100% identical to a morale that I found in San Francisco. <laughs> so this, uh, this species was described from the driveway of the Institute of Ecology in Jalapa, and turns up uh, all over the United States, probably in uh, Illinois as well. And then we have Gyromitra infila. This one is the only Gyromitra that grows directly from wood. Really big one, but pretty easy to identify. These sarcospheres are mycorrhizal of pine, and they're a really good indicator for morels. Mm -hmm. So out west in California, we hike around the mountains looking for sarcospheres, and when we see them, then we look closer for morels. Here's a massive xericomelis. This was about six or seven inches across. Um, this is a new undescribed species. And they have some really cool little ascomycetes here. Pythia vulgaris grows on Amy's wood. Uh, Gymnopus dryophilus is super common. A lot of books say it's poisonous, and I think that is true. But um, it's also pretty good to eat. <laughs> and they sell it in the park markets pretty common. I think just some people have problems with it. And Zizogospora mycetophila is a parasite on Gymnopus dryophilus. And the first time I saw this, I was just floored. I was like, wow. 
And um, after a few years of hunting in Mexico, I found that it's actually really common um, under pine. And it makes these things just look ridiculous. <laughs> Here's a new species of agaricus in the agaricus subrutalescens group. These are really delicious, and you put KOH on the cap, the cap turns green. Here's my Jeep. Um, so what I did is I bought this Jeep in Guadalajara for about $4,000, and then when I leave Mexico, I just let some Mexican borrow it. And it is so much cheaper than renting a car, just having one that lives down there. And if you look in front, you can see a big old mushroom here, and that's Boletus adulis, the king bull wheat. And these are really delicious. Um, you can tell it's the king bull ape because it has this reticulation and that like pattern on the stipe. And when you fry them up, they taste a lot like bacon, even if you're not cooking them in bacon grease. So I have a lot of vegetarian friends in California, um, and I'll, I'll cook this up and I'll, I'll give this to them, and they'll start giving me dirty looks because they think that I added bacon grease or something like that, but really I didn't. It really just tastes like bacon. And unfortunately, this year I wasn't able to eat any of these because I believe these are new species. So instead of eating my collections, I dried and saved all of them. They're all in the herbarium now. They'll all be DNA sequenced and we'll describe it as new, if it is indeed new. It might be one of the king bullies from the eastern United States. It's definitely not the bully that's do this from Europe. Is it pine or spruce? This grows with pine. I've never seen it with spruce or fir in Mexico. Always pine. If it's not new, yeah, if it's not new, then I'll just go ahead and eat it. <laughs> uh, the Thale Clavulina Myceliosa just got a new, la new name last year. Uh, the year before that, it was Romeria Myceliosa. And pretty nice, uh, you know, feathery thing. You're edible. The Gyromitra Esculenta, this thing was massive. It was six inches tall. So, after, um, after District Federal, I head west and went to Jalisco. Jalisco is another one of my favorite places in Mexico. And Jalisco is where I first started hunting mushrooms in Mexico. This is what Jalisco looks like. And so when I first started coming in 2007, I just met this, this random Mexican guy at the airport because uh, he posted some pictures on shroomery and he um, took me here. And within an hour of getting off the airplane, we were finding just amazing mushrooms like I had never seen. And, in that moment. <coughs> this is also Belisco. Um, and this is what they call a habitat called Bosque Mesophilo, or cloud forest. So you can see back here, this is all a, a mixed oak hardwood forest, and the clouds come in every day. And this habitat, there is just amazing species diversity, both plant and fungal, really neat stuff. And then while I was up there, there was this really ridiculous rain shower, and it washed out the roads, and it uh, stranded a whole lot of people up there. And so these are the guys uh, rescuing their tomato crop. And for some reason, um, the Mexicans like to put all of these altars all over everything. Um, so this is like the Virgin Mary or something. And like every like kilometer or so, there'll be some kind of altar along the side of the road. Uh, but if you look, up over here, there's a polypore. And that polypore is Postia casea. And this is the only polypore that turns blue. And uh, always pretty fun to find. And then they have a bunch of uh, phallus species. So these smell really bad. And they uh, hatch out of these eggs. And they have a lot of Cortinarius. These are the Cortinarius from the section Dermosity. And section dermosity is really good for dyeing fabric. So you boil these in water and then you can put wool or silk in there and uh, changes the color permanently. This is almost certainly a new undescribed species, so I'm giving it to Dimitar and we're going to sequence this and give it a new name. There are so many spe species of Cantharellus in Mexico, and almost all of them are undescribed. So this is another thing that I wasn't able to eat this year because I Saving all of them, giving them to Matthew Fultz for his Cantharellus research. So um, there's a, several species. That was the pine one. Now this is the oak one. This one's pretty large. Really nice apricot flavor. And then this is a white one um, with the purple caps. And this one is really big and really common. 
in the Volcan de Fuego, which is an active volcano, um, but I have never seen it anywhere else. And there's a lot of mushrooms in Mexico like that. They'll be super common in one woods, and then I won't see it anywhere else that I wander around. But we collected a whole basket full. They're really good. And here's a genus I had never seen until I started going down in Mexico, uh, Pseudocrayrellus. <coughs> Kind of like a real, uh, real tiny little black trumpet, just a couple centimeters across on the cap. And these are always on that growing mycorrhizal milk. And they have some beautiful lepiotis there. It starts out really purple. And Bolita sortonii is an edible one. Um, this is one that I've only seen in Volcán de Fuego and has a really cool texture on the top of the cap. But I can tell it's edible because it doesn't stain blue, it doesn't have the red pores. All the bull leaves that uh, don't stain blue and don't have red pores are edible. And this is one, we, fo we found this and we said, wow, we, this has to be a new species, never seen anything like it. And we put the spores under the microscope and they were crusate, which means they're in the shape of a cross. And I had never seen anything like that either. So we did a search of literature, found that in the 70s, Gaston Guzman described this from Oaxaca as Trichomosporum trapicali. And kind of a farinaceous, grainy odor. The locals here eat this. And uh, it was really cool to find. It's super unique. And then when I found this, I thought it was a Cortinarius. So I collected it for Demitar, and as I was doing the microscopy on the spores, I was shocked to find the spores were crusade, like that other trickle spore. So these actually have white spores, and it's not Cortinarius at all. It just, um, just kind of looks like Cortinarius. And they have a lot of cordyceps in Mexico. <coughs> on this log, I saw more cordyceps than I've ever seen anywhere in my life. There was just thousands of them all over the log. And so I ripped the log open, and there was all these little bugs in there, uh, coleopterus, and the, just about every one was parasitized by these cordyceps. Do people do anything with those? In Mexico, they don't do anything with cordyceps. Occasionally, when we find them, we'll pop them in our mouth if, uh, if there's so many that we don't need them for the herbarium specimen. And uh, they don't do anything, so that might mean they might be medicinal or something. Certainly not bad for you. <laughs> this inosity is really cool. Um, it's really has a really thick stem, really thick spike, which is unusual for inosity. A nice carrot orange color. And then when you break the spike, it snaps with an audible snap, hmm. like a carrot. And pretty sure this is a new species. Hmm. So here's an amanita from section Phylloideae. And when I took this picture, I thought that all these were the same species. And I was wrong. Uh, turns out that all of the smaller ones, when you put potassium hydroxide on the cap, they immediately turn bright yellow. And then the bigger ones, when you put potassium hydroxide on the cap, there's almost no change. So the ones on the right are in the Amanita bisporigera group. And the larger ones are in the Amanita elliptosperma group. A really cool thing about this is when they get really old, the gills turn raspberry color. <laughs> And this is the Amanita lithosperma group. And this, uh, these caterpillars, my friends warned me, don't touch these caterpillars. <laughs> and so, of course, I picked it up and put it on this mushroom. <laughs> and it didn't sting me, and so I started trying to sting myself on purpose, just kind of bumped the back of my finger against it. And man, it hurts. <laughs> really bad for about five minutes, and then it went away, and then after that, the mosquito bites were worse. So, yeah, it wasn't really all that bad. This inosity is really cool. It smells just like matsutake, and uh, so a really strong cinnamon odor. And it has these really cool green, kind of bluish green tones on there. But no matter how much you damage it, it doesn't get any bluer, not any greener. So it's not one of the psilocybin containing inosities. It's just a blue inosity. And here's Caprinus comatus. The shaggy manes get really big. This one was about 16, 18 inches tall. And you can see there's a full-size lighter down here. And you can see it turns into ink as a spore dispersal strategy. 
And this ink was just dripping off as I was sitting here. So all the time, it's dripping down, ridiculously black ink. A lot of people use it to do drawings. So it's a really nice, almost like India ink, uh, jet black. And then you can also use the, the light text from the Lenteria Syndigo to get a really nice uh, watercolor blue. And here's a cordyceps that I found. <clears throat> this one I gave to a cordyceps expert in Mexico City. And she's extracted DNA from this, so we can see exactly what it is. Most people call it militaris, but she said, no, it's not militaris. So you can see it's kind of coming out of a twig here. And everyone knows that cordyceps does not grow on wood. So I took a couple pictures of it, and then I cut it open. And there's the bug in the middle. So this, uh, this is a coleoptera. Large order of bugs. So when you're identifying cordyceps, you have to figure out if it's coleoptera or lepidoptera. Lepidoptera are like butterfly type larvae. Mm -hmm. And then that can lead you to what species it is. And so the mycelium parasitized, uh, completely colonized this bug. And then it tried to find a hole in the wood. And it grew following the light until it got over here. And then it found this natural hole and fruited through that. All the macrolepidotas in Mexico are a new, undescribed species. These are really delicious, but I couldn't eat it. So um, it's another one we're going to do the DNA for time. Really big, though. It's about six inches across. And the macrolepidotas have this beautiful pattern, kind of a snake, snake skin pattern on the spike, and that's how you differentiate it from chlorophyllum. And here's Cretherellus neotubeformis, nice little chanterelle type thing. Uh, got kicked out of Cantharellus and put into Craterellus along with um, but all the other little tiny chanterelles that have really thin, long spikes like that. And they do have a lot of Craterellus cornucopioides down there. This is the East Coast version. It's very different from the Craterellus cornucopioides we have in California. And Bullius subvolutipes is beautiful. It has bright red pores, and cut it open, and just within a couple seconds, you have this amazing color. And everybody says that uh, bullies that stain blue or have red pores are poisonous, but this one is actually edible. And Agaricus agustus is, uh, this one is really big. This Agaricus smells like almonds. And the one on the right is about 12 inches across. And this is actually an undescribed species. The real Agaricus agustus is in, um, in from Europe. And then in California, we have three, uh, three different species going under the name Agaricus agustus. You probably have a few different ones here in Illinois going under that name. So it's a pretty difficult species complex. But I picked all this and dried it, hoping that it's going to be a type collection for a new species. Really nice veil. This one was about seven inches across. And they're really cool when they're young, too. It's really nice colors. And yeah, they're really big. <laughs> and here's Psilocybe youngensis. Uh, Psilocybe youngensis is the only Psilocybe <coughs> in Mexico that grows directly from wood. So we find these on, um, on, these, on very well decayed hardwood logs. And they're really photogenic, so I like taking pictures of them. That's what they look like when they're really old. I always acutely ump in it. And um, you know, photos like these, you can see you can actually see the gills. And that's because I held the reflector just outside of the frame. And so did a long exposure with low ISO and then bounced some light back out of the upper stem and the gills with the reflector. And that's a really important thing to do. And in fact, you can take really amazing professional quality photos with a you know cheap $20 camera you get off eBay. And the secret is just to use a reflector to bounce some light back up onto that, and also a tripod. Volveriella grows out of vulvas. This is the first time I've ever seen a volveriella growing right out of a tree. I guess it's common in Illinois, but we don't have anything like this in California. And this is the biggest species of Lacaria in the world. It's currently undescribed, and it can be up to 10 inches tall. <coughs> And we always find it with oak. I've had several collections of this, so I intend to give this one a name. 
This one is fun to find. Ostrobolethus neotropicalis. Uh, really cool texture on the stipe here. And then there's all these green colors. It's the only bull I've ever seen that's just naturally green. And here's some more Ostrobolethus neotropicalis. And Isaria tenuipes. Um, this one, when you touch it, it releases a huge cloud of spores. And this is another one that only grows on insects. So when you dig it up, you find the, the host insect. And here's how you take a nice picture. Um, this is a trichoglossum, and the photo I'm taking, the, the mushroom is actually right here. But I just wanted to show you how I set up the reflector. And almost always, direct sunlight is terrible for mushrooms. You want to do whatever you can to avoid direct sunlight. But in this case, I decided just to go with it. And so it, um, the reason it's bad is because the cameras don't have as much dynamic range as your eye. So we look at a mushroom in direct sunlight, it looks awesome. But when we take a picture, the shadows are really harsh, and we can't see anything in the shadow, so it's marines with shock. So using this uh, collapsible reflector, I bounce the sunlight from back in the other direction, so there would be no harsh shadow. And then you get a photo like this. And so the common name of these are earth tongues. They have really cool spores with lots of segments in them. Really fun under the microscope. And you can see here they have little tiny hairs all over them. And that's what separates trichoglossum from geoglossum. This is one I like to find, uh, Omphalotus mexicanus. <laughs> And so this is closely related to the Omphalotus eludens that's really poisonous here in Illinois. And it um, took me a couple of years to identify this, but it's such a big, blue, striking mushroom with um, margin, you know, very blue gill edges. But I figured someone must have, <clears throat> must have seen it. So I emailed Gaston Guzman and asked him, and he said, oh yeah, I described that in the 70s, and that's uh, Omphalotus mexicana. Is that I've tried, and it definitely does not blow in the dark. This is a new species of Gymnopolis. I first found it in 2009, did some microscopy, and sent it to the world expert in Gymnopolis, which is Laura Guzman. And she said, yeah, this is a new species that I'm working on, and I've only found it in the maple forest. And this maple forest is amazing. It's the only maple forest in Mexico. It's about a square mile. Mexico used to be covered in maple forests. But then the Ice Age came, and almost all the maples died out. But there was one patch. And that's a really great place uh, to go mushroom hunting. So I spent two weeks studying the fungi in the maple forest. And that was partially because my uh, Jeep broke down right outside of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a problem with the piston rod. Piston rod broke. In the United States, that's a three or $4,000 repair. In Mexico, it's about $500 repair. And the mechanics in Mexico are really awesome. They do a great job. But this species of Gymnopolis is really easy to identify. It's close to Gymnopolis picreus but it has very close gills, and this brown, stipe, brown smooth stipe is pretty distinctive. And then we have Ophiocoriceps spherocephala. And this is the first time I had found this. Um, so this tree over here on the left doesn't look like much, but if you look at the base of this tree, there are tons of wasps that are dead, and then the cordyceps are coming out of the wasps. <laughs> So they're really cool. They got you know, a whole bunch of heads on there. And uh, there, then you have the parathesia, which are where it makes the spore. So those are all the little bumps you see on the, on the head of the cordyceps there. And these things are always really cool under the microscope. And some more Somosity Zapticorum. And when I took these photos, um, I, I brought my friend with me, and he's a hippie, and so he was trying to pick them like crazy, and I said, no, no, you can't pick these mushrooms. I'm trying to take the world's best photos of Solosity Septicorn. And he's like, come on, man. I, you already have like 4,000 photos of these online. I said, no, no, I'm much better at taking photos this year than I was the other years. And so he kind of got mad and stormed off, and that's okay, because there are some nice photos of all of them. <laughs> So, um, yeah, you, you never want to take a hippie to uh, your philosophy patch, because <laughs> then when you go back there to photograph them, they're not going to be there the next year. Mm. But these are just my favorite philosophy to photograph, because they have you know, this really cool stem texture. I think it's probably the strongest 
uh, psilocybin mushroom in Mexico. I've never tried eating it. Uh, but it stains blue like crazy. This is the one that Maria Sabina uh, would feed to Gordon Watson in the 50s. And here's one with two heads. And then Mycena liana is one that uh, I think you guys get here in Illinois. Never seen it in California. But it has really cool microscopic features. So you pop this under the scope and you have no trouble finding the cystidia. Huge, bright orange mucronate cystidia all over the place. So if you see it, definitely collect it and dry it. Save it for the microscope. And then Bisomorilius incarnata is a really cool polypore. This one is parasitic. Uh, so this is not eating the wood. This is eating this other polypore over here, and then this polypore here is eating the wood. And that's pretty common now that we're discovering, you know, we pay close attention to some, some, certain mushrooms when we find them, they're always near other mushrooms. And that's because they're parasitic on those species. Grammaria stricta, pretty commonly sold in markets. They're pretty good. And this Chelsiporus, new species undescribed. And I figured I'd throw this, throw this one in here because it's just like the American flag with the red, white, and blue. And here's Psilocybe caberlescence. And this one is another one in the Darumbe group. So this one is growing in the sawmill. And the sawmill closed down about 10 years ago. And now it's just covered in Psilocybe. It's all over the place. You can hardly walk without tripping on these. And I guess these are really strong, too. I haven't tried these either, but apparently um, apparently the hippies are all about them. But they grow in huge clusters, really cool spike texture. And then this one, you know, it's got a spore print on the cap, but there was some grass and some leaves on there, so it made a really cool print. And there's what the spores look like. And this Ophiocordyceps melanonthe, um, named that, species epithet is named after the genus of beetle here. So another thing that only grows on this certain bug. This is another one that we're extracting DNA out of. And we call this one Hidnacea sensulata. And uh, the name Hidnacea sensulata is like weasel words stacked on top of weasel words. <laughs> So um, weasel words are really useful in mycology because they indicate that you know that it's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the name, you don't know what it is, but you try to put it into a group. So sensu lato is Latin for in the broad sense, and then hidnacea is a huge family that has many genuses in it. So we know it's in that family, maybe. Uh, yeah, we actually have no idea what this is. <laughs> I've collected a bunch of times, done a bunch of microscopy on it, sent it to a bunch of experts, and no one's been able to put a name on it. So we're going to have to check the DNA, paste that in GenBank, see what it's close to, and maybe we can find something in the literature. Uh, but the natives do eat this one. Uh, it's pretty soft. I think it's pretty good. Coprinellus disseminatus is always cool to find. You find one, you find thousands. And I always like to do uh, macro shots at the underside. And with this macro shot, you can see there's no shadows. Usually when you do a macro with a flash, there's really harsh shadows, because the flash is always going to cast a very harsh shadow behind the stipe, and that's bad. So I got a ring flash, and the ring flash is only 100 bucks on Amazon. And if you have a DSLR, you should really have a ring flash. You can do macro photography. It makes such a difference. Um, especially the closer you get, the cooler it looks. And this kind of shot is so easy to take. You just put the ring flash on there and set the f-stop really small and then just put it right next to the mushroom and press the button. It literally takes 10 seconds. This is one they call a Garicus anthodermis in Mexico. It's definitely not the Garicus anthodermis that we have in California. It might be the Garicus anthodermis we have in Illinois. Really nice yellow staining on there. So this one smells like a chemical factory, like ink. So you know it's one of the poisonous ones. And when you scratch it, it turns yellow within about two seconds. And it's the only species of agaricus that goes this really bright highlighter yellow immediately, no matter where you scratch it on the body. Here's some more undescribed macrolepiota. 
And this place is really cool. There's all these, um, these trees that are kind of like this artificial pine cassowaries that were imported from, um, from Australia. And then deflexulas are really cool. Deflexulas look a whole lot like Heresium arenaceus, but it's actually kind of over in the polypore group, so they're pretty tough. Uh, but I always like photographing them. And pictures like this are really easy to take. And even when you're in direct sunlight, you can take photos like this without needing any kind of black background or anything. And all you do is you set your f-stop really small and you turn your flash up nice and bright. And then set manual focus and keep moving the mushroom until it's in focus and press the button. And what happens is all of the light from the flash bounces right off there. And because there's so much light coming from the flash and so little light in comparison coming from the direct sunlight that you're standing in, that you just, uh, don't see any of the background at all. So you get this beautiful black background effect. And here's Guinevere helveloides, kind of a little jelly-like thing. Grows on wood. And then we found this um, mysterious rhizomorphic mycelium all over the place. And just lots of patches of it. And it was just like taking over the woods, some, some of the ravines that were just covered in it. And we couldn't figure out what it was, but I tasted it. It had a really familiar taste, kind of like burnt rubber. And then I found this. Um, it was, this one was fruiting. So it's a gymnopa species. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of gymnopa species that have this burnt rubber taste. But the rhizomorphic mycelium is very unique. And this one, when I found it, I was like, wow, what could this be? And so I took it home, did the microscopy. It has amyloid spores that are ornamented, so that puts it in the genus Leucopaxillus. So we did a literature search. There are no Leucopaxillus that look anything like this, except for a couple that are described from Africa that are actually way different. So this is a new species as well. And this is a Leuco agaricus, really co close to Leuco agaricus rubrotinctoides, but probably a new species as well. And in Mexico, they have this thing with the cypress, where there's all sorts of species that grow in cypress stuff that don't grow anywhere else. And they do that in California, too. And if you have any cypress planted out here, they probably do it here as well. So it's full of Leuco agaricus, the biota, pseudobiospora, and agaricus. <coughs> So many undescribed species under Cyprus. There's an undescribed species of Lepiota. There's over there under the Cyprus as well. And here's Boletus Satanoides. Uh, at least that's what I was calling it, because I have this Mexican mushroom book, and I looked it up, and there it was, this Boldy. So I put it up in Mushroom Observer, and the experts from Europe are like, yeah, that doesn't hardly look anything at all like the real Boletus Satanoides which is a name from Europe. So that's why I call it Sensu Oct Mex, and that means in the sense of the Mexican authors. <laughs> so that way, you know, it's, it's this, you know, saying that it's different from the European species, and it's, it's not unknown, it's well documented in the books, but it doesn't have any real Latin name yet. I mean, I only found one of those, so I can't give it one. I like to uh, describe, when I describe a new species, I like this. Have several different collections from several locations. Pythia cupressii is really tiny. It uh, <coughs> only grows on cypress stuff. <coughs> so these are only about a millimeter tall. The last go my seat thing. And then Lexinum rugoseps mm -hmm. is pretty common under oak. This is a good, a really good edible species. And has a really nice cap texture as well. You know, it's all rugose on the cap. And then there is so much Marasmias diversity in Mexico, it's really amazing. Um, there are so many undescribed Marasmias. And the cool thing about Marasmias is you pop them under the scope, and half of them have these really cool broom cells. And broom cells, as the name implies, it looks just like brooms. So when you do a crush mount, it kind of looks like something out of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And then we have Cronardium quercum. This is a parasite on pine. And so it makes this bright orange kind of um, spores in here. And it's very powdery spores. And so I put that under the scope, and it looks like this. 
And so they're kind of cool, and the spores are all very irregular in shape. And then the, the spore wall is very thick and transparent. And then the middle of the spore is very bright orange. And this orange color here is what gave it the orange color in the other photo that you just saw. And this anthoboma is about six inches tall. Really cool. But it was in a really deep, dark forest. So I had to do a six second exposure to get this one. And I just never seen anything like it with the huge size and the cobalt blue color. And these have pink spores and they're sapotrophic, so you should be able to cultivate them. It sure would be cool to have a tray of these growing. Here's another entheloma. <clears throat> this one might be entheloma in canum. It's got a really nice uh, green stain on the top there. And here's one that took me a while to identify. It's Crepidotis. There's another one you probably get here in Illinois, the Phyllotopsis nigulans. And Phyllotopsis nigulans had, um, looks almost exactly like this, but it smells terrible. When I smelled this, I didn't get any, any odor at all. And then when I did the microscopy, it turned out that the spores were roughened and brown and kind of teardrop shaped, and that put it in the genus Crepidotis. And then we did the literature search, found that there was nothing described um, anything like this. This is the largest species of Crepidotis I've ever seen, and also the most yellow. Erasmus cladophilus has very strong intervenous gills. So you can see they're all cross-veined and astigmatizing like this. And then somatoderma caperata. Another very cool polypore type thing. Very smooth underside. So this is a polypore that has spores so small that you can't see it with a microscope. And then here's Psilocybe kinei. This is a species of Psilocybe that I just found for the first time this past trip to Mexico. And they always have a really acute umbo that's off-center like that, always pointing off in one direction or the other. And this is uh, characterized by two types of chylocystidia, two types of chlorocystidia. Bolotellus, this is really cool. This Bolotellus grows under oak. And um, it's definitely a new species. For a while, we were calling it Bolotellus cingeri, but we got our hands on the type collection of Bolotellus cingeri. And the spores are different. It's not Bolotellus cingeri, it's something new. But the Bolotellus have this really cool veil. And the veil was covering the gills, and then it started to release spores. And so all of these uh, polka dot speckles that you see on the veil are where the pores were. And the dumping spores are all over the veil. The Bolotellus was split off from Boletus because the spores are longitudinally striate. So you know they almost look like they have wings on them all over them. The Boletus have smooth spores. This probably helps them fly through the air a little bit better. And this is the first time I've ever seen this genus, Bluminavia. And these smell awful. I think they're worse than any of the stinkhorns we have in the United States. And then I went to Oaxaca. Uh, Oaxaca, really cool place. So much nice fruit in Oaxaca. So they have all these awesome fruit stands. And then over here, they were selling Amanita Baciae. And Amanita Baciae, uh, if you go to Mexico, all of the people in Mexico call it Amanita Cesarea. But Amanita Cesarea is a name from Europe and does not occur in North America at all. So Amanita Baciae is a good name from Mexico. And these are huge, super popular with the locals. A lot of times we'll be driving along and we'll see guys carrying them around. Here's some Psilocybe hoochigenii, and this one has a really strong acute umbo on there. And this was collected by Gordon Watson in 1959. And I found this at the ENCB Herbarium in Mexico City, and it had been preserved in alcohol. And I, you know, I couldn't believe it. It still had the same color and the same shape. It looked like almost just like it did the day they picked it. 
And then this one is Chlorotus obtutiae. Um, this one grows on agave cactus, and it also grows on prickly pear. And uh, pretty cool species of oyster mushroom. It looks like that. And then if you flip it over and look at the bottom of it, it looks like that. And so it's the only Chlorotus I've ever seen that does this um, cool thing at the gill edges like that. And here's Aeroscalpium vulgare, sent to uh, North America, the sense of the North American authors. And the reason I call it Sensu Oct NA is when I first started getting into DNA analysis, the first thing that I did when I learned how to use GenBank is I downloaded all of the Aeroscalpium vulgare sequences from all over the world. And I put together a phylogenetic tree. And I could see the European ones all kind of formed a little clade. And there was kind of close to the North American ones, but the North American ones were very much clustered, meaning it's not the European species. And then the Japanese ones are way out there, totally different. And so all three of these mushrooms are growing under the name Aeroscopium vulgari, but they're definitely different. So uh, these are always really cool to photograph. They grow off of pine cones, usually. I don't know if you get these here. They're pretty common in California. And then Hemiaporus betula, really cool bowl leaf. It's the first time I've ever seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just have a really nice thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some nice colors on the cap as well. And then here's Boletus luidiformis, or this color. Really nice cobalt blue stain <coughs> on this one. Cut it open in just within two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. It would look blue like that. And uh, like all of the red cord bullies, this one has a very bad reputation as being poisonous. Um, but that is maybe more of an artifact of the Satan's bully, people just thinking about Satan and everything. Actually, most of the red cord bullies are edible. It's just that nobody eats them because all the books say they're poisonous. Here's a chrysophilina. Uh, chrysophilinas are always fun to find. It's probably undescribed. And here is the fungus <coughs> bear. Uh, this is the one in Quaquimaloyas. And so there's a few fungus bears in Oaxaca, or there's a few fungus bears in Mexico. Uh, the one in Oaxaca, in Quaquimaloyas, is kind of a tourist thing. So you pay 50 bucks, and then they take you around, and you get meals and lodging and all that stuff. And so the first day, they send everyone, split up into everyone in the groups, and they send you all out. And they all, you all collect mushrooms, and it's a big mushroom hunting competition. So all the groups lay out all of their um, mushrooms on, the, um, on, on these blankets here. And then they had me be one of the judges, and I would go around and chomp how many species they had. And some of the groups had just uh, pretty close to 200 species. It's pretty amazing for a morning of collecting. So you see a bunch of the blankets laid out there. And uh, this one is Gumphus flacosis. And just this year, it got moved into Turbinellus. So now we call it Turbinellus flacosis. And this one is um, pretty good. It uh, tastes just like a chanterelle, but all the people say it's edible. But then in the markets, they were selling it. And I had eaten it a few times, and I didn't have any problems. So I decided to do a test, and I made dinner. And the centerpiece of the dinner was uh, Turbinellus flacosis, and I just wanted to see if it's possible if I could on purpose poison myself. <laughs> and it turns out the answer was yes. <laughs> um, it actually wasn't that bad. Um, you know, the next morning I had some gastrointestinal issues, but you know, that went away after about five minutes, and I felt fine the rest of the day. So they have a sugar in there called Trellos, which is indigestible. And so, if you eat, if you find these, you can eat them. Just um, you know, just make it a side dish. Just don't make it the centerpiece. And then down here, they have bolete to do list. These are super popular. Um, in Quahimaloya, all of the restaurants serve uh, breaded, fried bolete to do list, which is just delicious. And then up here, they got some Amanita muscaria and a big pile of Amanita bassii. The Amanita bassii. So beautiful looking. The flavor is really disappointing. It's, um, it's bland. It's um, it's not even really that good. 
Uh, ironically, one of the most delicious mushrooms is Amanita muscaria. And what I usually do is I fry it up just by so I fry it up in butter, then I serve it as a side dish, and I serve everybody about two bites. And they're like, wow, I want more of that. And I'm like, no, sorry. <laughs> Uh, because if you eat between four and six bites, then you kind of get this feeling like you drank a couple beers. And if you eat more than that, then I guess it gets really unpleasant. I've never tried eating more than that. Um, but just as a side dish, it is so good. It is one of the most delicious edible mushrooms. And you can parboil it to remove the poisons. That also removes most of the flavor. So I was a West Coast mushroom hunter. When I first started going to Mexico, I had extreme difficulty identifying stuff. Nothing that's uh, endemic to the West Coast is found in Mexico. Um, but you guys, you guys are from Illinois, so if you went to Mexico, you would recognize all sorts of species. And the reason for that is that the East and the West Coast are separated by the Rocky Mountains, so you don't really get too much mixing between the East and the West. And then the East Coast of the United States is connected via forest all the way down to southern Mexico. In the west coast, there's a huge desert between, that, uh, between those two places, and so the spores don't really cross the desert. Are there yeah. mushrooms in those deserts at all? Yeah, those deserts have really awesome mushrooms in them. <laughs> um, and so the thing to do is just to wait for when it rains and then go out into the desert. And they are so rarely collected, but they're actually super common. They're really easy to find. One reason they're super common is that when they fruit, they can stay there for months or even years um, until it rains again. And um, But nobody ever goes mushroom hunting in the desert, so <laughs> nobody ever finds them. But when you do find them, um, they're super cool to photograph. I think this was our, our group here. Um, we didn't win the contest or anything. I would have felt bad winning if I was one of the judges. <laughs> and you see we always carry tackle boxes around. Um, tackle boxes are a really good way to save all your mushrooms. Um, keep them all separate. And really the thing to do is when you take your photos of the mushrooms, every time you take a photo, the fo camera will assign a number photo number, and then you write that number on a piece of paper, put it in the little tackle box segment with your mushroom. So later you won't have any trouble figuring out which mushrooms uh, you know, go with which, which dried mushrooms go with which photo. If you don't do that, you know, some of your collections just become worthless, because after a day of collecting, you, know, you might have lots of stuff that looks the same. A lot of it can be different microscopically, but looks the same macroscopically, and there's just no way to sort it out if you don't write that number down when you take the picture. Is this in the summer or fall? Or so the, the mushroom season in Mexico starts around mid-June, and it goes until November. Mm -hmm. And so the peak of it is July and August, and so they have this in mid-July. So if you want to go to Mexico for mushroom hunting, you probably should go in either mid-July and hit this Pachymaloyas fungus fair, or go in um, mid-August and hit the Michoacan fungus bear. <coughs> the Michoacan fungus bear is way different, and that fungus bear um, is run by the city, so it's free, and they pay all these Mexicans to go out and fill up truckloads full of, um, you know, pickup trucks full of mushrooms, and they bring them all back, and I put names on all of them, put them out all on display. That's really fun. What kind of elevation in general? Well, these photos I'm showing you here are really high elevation. Pajim is 3,200 meters, so about 10,000 feet. And up at high elevation, you get just totally different mushrooms than you get at medium elevation, than you get at low elevation. So if you go down to low elevations, like near the coast, you find all sorts of stinkhorns and copalandias and stuff like that. But you also get a lot of chiggers, ticks, poisonous snakes. <laughs> And so this year, I went to the low elevation one day, and I got four ticks, 200 sugar bites, and so never again. So what I really like to do is um, drive up into the mountains, and I start mushroom hunting when I get to about 1,500 meters elevation. And that's where the really cool stuff comes in anyway. 
for example, at low elevation, there's only one species of psilocybe. Up at high elevation, there's 16 species of psilocybe. So the species diversity is exponentially more at the higher elevations. What's the temperature up there? So at the really high elevations, it's really cold. And these mushrooms uh, have ad adaptations. So when you get up in the morning, they'll be frozen solid. Wow. And by noon, they'll be all melted. And they won't turn into puddles of mush like most mushrooms. They'll actually be totally fine. They have chemicals like they're work like an antifreeze. So this one's uh, right around here. It was like mid 60s, low 70s in the day, and then like 20s and 30s in the night. And so you know, whatever temperature you're comfortable at, you can just go to that elevation in the mountains and hang out there. We always drive down the low elevations through our camping, um, and then drive back up to the higher elevations during the day when we get hot lower places. And I like this photo uh, from Atamsa's Pinnacle. And one thing that I saw in Mexico this year that I didn't see in previous years is tons of iPhones. <laughs> the girl has one, everybody has them. And so I got one this year. It's so helpful just to be able to put in directions and have it tell me where to turn right, where to turn left. And this is the microscope that I um, bring. So this microscope lives in Mexico. And we always set it up at the fungus fairs where it's super popular with the kids. Sometimes there'll be 15 or 20 kids lined up to um, see the microscope. So what I started doing is using a camera with a digital output that can connect to a projector or a screen. And that way I can show everybody what's going on in the microscope at once. And here's how I dry my collections. Um, they dry really well on the dashboard as long as you're driving a lot every day. If you're not driving, it's a little more problematic. What I do is I put all of my collections in these paper bags. And then I write the number from the photo of the camera and the paper bags. And I just throw them all on the dashboard. And after three or four days, then I put them into Tupperware boxes that have desiccant. And the desiccant just keeps them from rehydrating. And that's a real problem in Mexico, because when it rains, it gets really humid, and then all of your dry mushrooms will soak up all the rain from the air, and then they'll get moldy, and you won't be able to extract any DNA from them. So um, really important to take really good care of your dried mushrooms. <coughs> and that's something I learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. But it's a problem all throughout Mexico. When I go to the herbariums and study the type collections, a lot of the type collections would be moldy. And I would show the curators, and they would just freak out and throw them immediately on the dehydrator. Um, but yeah, it's a difficult issue. And we're coming just about to the end of my talk. Um, but this girl here is Meaty. And Meaty is an amazing chemist, and she makes new cancer drugs. And so she comes out mushroom hunting with us, and when we find new or rare species of polypores, she brings them into the lab. And she uh, extracts them with a nonpolar solvent and also polar water extraction. And then runs them through, um, <clears throat> well first, yeah, she takes these extractions and then she tries them on cancer cells in the test tubes. And if they work and they kill the cancer, then she runs the extract through gel chromatography and that separates all of the molecules, all the constituents of the mushroom, separates them out by the size of the molecules. And then she tries each fraction on the cancer cells to figure out what the exact chemical is. Once she figures out which fraction it is that's killing the cancer cells, then she uses GCMS and HPLC to elucidate which molecule it is. And very often, they're new molecules unknown to science. But this here is polke. And polke is this really cool alcoholic drink <laughs> that is basically uh, fermented agave. And it's fermented with uh, bacteria and yeast at the same time. And um, in Mexico, you see signs all along the side of the road that say pulque. And the rich people in Mexico kind of turn their nose up at it. But all the poor people love this stuff. And we think it's great. And so you got to bring your own bottles, because people that sell other super poor and they don't have bottles. Um, but it's pretty good. And it's really common at parties. So what, um, what she would do is we'd go to this, uh, this town in Las Vegas, which is famous for pulque, and just ask around if we'd find somebody that's selling pulque and then get a whole bunch of it and bring it back 
And then we put it in the blender with like mangoes and strawberries and give it a really good flavor. And she um, served it at her catering events. And the butterfly diversity in Mexico is really, really good. Um, there was one day that I was dri driving along Oaxaca and this um, military vehicle pulled up behind us. And I kind of pulled over to let them go. And then they stopped in front of us and all these guys with the machine gun jumped out and surrounded my Jeep. And they said, get out, get out. And like, okay. <laughs> and they spent about two minutes searching our Jeep. And I guess it was like an area that was known for drugs or something. And they didn't recognize us as one of the approved drug runners. <laughs> and so they wanted to see if maybe we were like from the rival cartel or something like that. Uh, but they only searched us for like 90 seconds and they were actually really nice to us. But I was kind of shaking after that, so we just took a walk and uh, went down by this creek, and there was tons of butterflies there. And they got some really nice butterfly pictures. And so this is a Dia ethria species. And Dia ethria is super hard to identify to species, so that's the genus. But they all say 88 on the back. Apparently that confuses the birds and stuff. And so they, the Mexicans call this the Chanta Ocho. <laughs> And uh, that's what it looks like. Lots of, lots of really nice mountains, pine oak forests there. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions, I can take questions. How do you know when you're walking on someone's private land or? You know, in Mexico, there's, they don't really have this thing with trespassing. Like, if you go to Texas and you walk on somebody's private land, they're going to, like, shoot you or yell at you. In Mexico, it's not really a big deal. They do it all the time. And so, you know, a lot of the places we go are national parks. But then a lot of the places we go are private land. And, you know, sometimes we'll just go mushroom hunting all day and we'll see the landowner and they'll be like, hey, what's, what's up? What are you guys doing? And they'll say, oh, we came from the United States to look at your mushrooms. And they're like, wow, that is so cool. Yeah. You guys come back here anytime. And by the way, our house is never locked. You can stay there whenever you want. They're just so nice about that. Um, but generally, you know, because you have to cross a barbed wire fence. Yeah, you know, most people think that most of the Cortinarius are poisonous, but that's not the truth. The truth is that about 90% of Cortinarius species are good edibles, and then there's just a few that are poisonous. Yeah, I know, like up in Wisconsin, there's one that's purple or blue, very small, strong order, like goats, basically. It's probably Cortinarius albovilaceus. Okay. Um, but the reason I say the purple quartz are edible is because there's a lot of people that pick blue, especially at least here. And there's a lot of Cortinarius that look for all the world like Lewis. And so people must mistake these all the time. But we don't have any records of anyone ever getting poisoned by a purple Cortinarius. So we think that all of the purple Cortinarius must be edible. Um, but there's a few Cortinarius edibility rules. You don't want to eat the little tiny Cortinarius. You don't want to eat the ones that turn bright colors and potassium hydroxide. And you don't want to eat the yellow ones that have an abruptly bulbous type. Other than that, they're pretty much all edible. Yeah, mushroom maybe have the two. Like, yeah. Up in Wisconsin, I think we have a lot of hydnums or something. Yeah, lots is of hydnums. It's kind of similar, and they're all edible there. Is that yeah, you know, felodons look a lot like hydnums, but the hydnums are softer. The felodons are really woody. Okay. So you wouldn't really want to eat it, probably, but you could boil it in water and use it for dyeing fabric. It's got a lot of hydnums on it. Alan, does the Mexican Oncolobus bioluminescent? No, it doesn't. We tried so many times. It definitely does not. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Boletus edulis. Boletus edulis? Yeah. Edulis, yeah. And you probably get it around here under pine and occasionally under oak. And it's the one they call porcini. And some, you can get them dried pretty commonly. And 
You know, in Mexico, when they, when they cook them, they don't taste of anything like bacon. And the reason for that is in Mexico, when they cook their mushrooms, they just kind of boil them in water or they throw them in with all of the other, other ingredients. And here, um, you know, when I cook mushrooms, I cook them separately from all the other ingredients. I do that so I can fry them really hot. And that causes something called the Mallard reaction, which starts at 280 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the same uh, chemical reaction that makes steak taste really good when you put it on the grill. So it denatures the proteins, turns them brown, makes them taste really good. And so when you cook the porcinis, they don't taste like bacon until that Mallard reaction happens. And so I cook them for probably about 18, 20 minutes. And that's when they really start tasting like bacon when they're browned all over. What do you guys think about our imported genius? Yeah. <laughs>